So Chris, the only true wisdom consists in knowing that you know nothing. That's us, dude. Oh yeah. Let's bag him. Yeah. Socrates. Okay, so what's that knowledge of what's truly important called? I guess that would be wisdom, Socrates. Oh, yes. to find happiness, you must have first cultivated wisdom. Tell me how you... All we are is dust in the wind, dude. Dust? Wind. Dude. Oh. Ah. How is Socrates within and without? How is he liminal? How is he monstrous? Oh goodness, that's awesome! I'm glad. I'm glad to see both of you, and uh, I like your new background, Bruce. I'm savoring the. Is that also like a AI generated image? It is. Yeah i I had it on yesterday when I was talking to uh, Layman, so it's still there. Sweet. What were you guys talking about? Just out of curiosity. Uh, he was helping me do a little uh, promo for the course I'm going to be offering. Oh yeah, why don't why don't you share that? Maybe someone that watches this will be interested. And uh, yeah, what well, what is that? And when is it? And I'll post a link in the description. Oh great! Well, yeah, um, it's going to be in March on March twelfth. Starting, it's going to run for six weeks, and I think it has a strong affinity. And in, in my mind, that's one reason why I wanted to organize it. I'm very interested in what's going on in metamodern and integral circles and the circles around John regarding the concern about and dialogue around meaning crisis and the poly crisis or meta crisis and how dialectic into D logos can play a role in all of that. And I've had some strong influences for a long time from David Bohm's work and his dialogue and also from uh, David Michael Levin, um, who also has made a pretty strong case for uh, different practices of the self, uh, uh, articulating a kind of sense-based ecologies of practice model and uh, looking at multiple philosophical traditions and practice traditions um, and trying to unpack both how we are conditioned in our senses to uh, in a particular way by a society to look and react to things in a particular way but that we can undergo development in our senses to a more critical reflexive mode so that we can begin to notice the gaps and the imbalances and, and become more political and, and socially engaged. But then there are also further dimensions that open up into deeper participatory and non-dual and implicit um, and, and holistic modes of perception um, that are sometimes tapped in different deep philosophical and contemplative traditions. And, but are not often widely pursued. But anyway, he charts all of that out. And so my interest is in wedding his approach to the senses to David Bohm's approach to uh, broad somatic awareness um, and, and the development of what he calls the Rhea Soma or flowing body as a support for dialogue and for proprioception of thought. Um, and I think there's a really strong potential for integration between those two approaches uh, for, for deepening in our embodied sense of an active participation in the world and for supporting um, dialogical and contemplative um, dimensions of our being. That's awesome. So, yeah, it's ironic that our society splits mind and body and then is really bad at both. And you're trying to enrich that through a historical study and then a practice-based uh, kind of approach. Is that... Am I dropping you right? Exactly, yes. And I'm doing it together with Lee Nickel, who was a close associate with uh, Bohm and helped develop the dialogue and uh, has worked with Bohm and published books on him since uh, the very beginning. And uh, it, Bohm's own comments to him about uh, some of the deficiencies of the dialogue and practitioners needed needing a broader base of practices and embodied modes of being and participating that inspired Lee to develop what's called the Holoflux work 
around translating Bohm's ideas into somatic um, practices. So he's done that in Italy and other places for a long time. Um, and so, yeah, we're working together to show what he's developed and what um, I've been exploring in Levin's work and how they integrate. Yeah, what's your take uh, oh, I, uh, on this, Layman? Yeah. I'll mention my upcoming course next week because I don't want to step on this. I do want to point out how on point it is for this episode of After Socrates because yeah, yeah. it's very uh, cynical in the positive sense, this course that you're working on, right? That in order to engage in the dialogical process, a person has to become more of a body and less conventionally constrained in the function of the senses. And that's very close to what John's saying about what the cynic's performance around wisdom is trying to demonstrate. Yeah, I was reminded of Antisthenes while Bruce was speaking as well. And I think um, it's uh, there's no panacea, right? So even though dialogue is profoundly um, expansive cognitively and interpersonally and even intrapersonally it's not like you can just be dialoguing um so so that's really cool and yeah we'll definitely plug your course i have a cult i'm starting to form but it's more long term so i'll plug my cult then later um, <laughs> <laughs> do any of you know the etymology of the name antisthenes I tried to look it up and didn't find much, right? It's anti-Slenese somehow, right? He's before or against whatever Slenese is. <laughs> I didn't find it online, but I prefer to fully translate so we can hear it land the way it would have to people who spoke that language. But I haven't found anything yet. Huh? No, I don't know. Um, I, I wonder. I, I don't even know how to spell it in Greek. That might help clue in to the, the etymology for sure. Um Cool. So, so I have some some Jeopardy, and uh, so it's a short one, but uh, laboring, especially philosophical laboring. Hmm. I'm going to side with Antisthenes and deny the power of language to make acceptable definitions. <laughs> <laughs> that would ruin all of jeopardy that, that, that philosophy is so it's a deeply held presupposition that there are definable <laughs> things in jeopardy <laughs> paradoxical jeopardy could be a whole new series after this one <laughs> yeah you've got me stumped on that one this is ponus so john uh, talks about it and he talks about it in parallel with this next one um so kind of a life of practice and a, a practice-oriented approach to reality. What is phronesis? Well, that's good, but close. Hmm. Any any guess, Bruce? What's that? A life of practice or uh, skill development to orientation towards philosophy. That's my next Jeopardy statement question. Oh, okay. Um, Yeah, I would have guessed something along the lines of phronesis as well in terms of the practical wisdom. But yeah, yeah. So anyway, I... it leads to phronesis, hopefully, ascesis. Oh, ascesis. All right. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. In fact, I was um, thinking of bringing in uh, some discussion of Slaughter Dyke today and his focus on ascesis. So, but I didn't make the connection. So we'll try to make that later. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Um, let's see. Let me just give you um harmonious conversations before reflection and being more virtuous what is antisthenes approach to, <laughs> um i don't know what is uh, cynicism oh, i like that layman any any uh, guesses no we're terrible on the terminology <laughs> that's good you you you've de you've defeated the episode that was really the moral of the episode is don't get caught in the definition so i think um there's like a uh counterfactual version of, of the score that we're keeping and you're rocking that part um, <laughs> right. um this is co-orientation strip down and be diogenes for this one that's i was wondering yeah I'm, I'm i'm headed to the market to do profane things right after this so um my sundial is set <laughs> Co-orientation? Co-orientation, yeah. So um, John is setting up like the, the future episodes where they do the practice and he's trying to emphasize that 
Layman, you taught me this one of the first times we talked. You said how important it was to build rapport um, in the front of these conversations, these especially these digital conversations, and um, how better your conversations were when you did that consciously. Um, all right, the, the difference between your participatory and perspectival state and what you're saying, which could be hypocritical. Say that one again. Yeah, so it's it's the difference between your participatory and perspectival state and what you're saying, which could be incorrect or hypocritical. I hope there's a prize for utter failure because uh <laughs> no, this is good. We're we're practicing metanoia. We're exp experiencing that we don't know. Uh, things that we definitely don't know. So performative contradiction was oh, the okay. answer for that one. Yeah. Um, Interesting. The way that John defines some of the things, there, there's a twist on them from the way that I typically have held them myself. So it's it's nice. It's nice to see. Okay. So so then the last thing we'll do is three quotes by um, by people that are, were, are or were Greek or were mentioned in the episode. Um, so you can just guess the author of this quote. Um, well-being is realized by small steps, but is truly no small thing. I don't know. Who is Antisthenes? Well, that's close. That's good. Layman, any other? No, but I knew it's... it wasn't Antisthenes. <laughs> good. Yeah, that, I think so, too. Yeah, because it's Zeno. So the, the founder of the ah, Stoics. The, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, stand a little less between me and the sun. Who is Diogenes? Diogenes. Right, exactly. And uh, the most useful piece of learning for the uses of life is to unlearn what is untrue. Now we have to resurrect Antisthenes. It is Antisthenes, exactly. Um, so good. That was fun. And, uh, you know, there's no purity codes to punish you for being impure <laughs> for any scores or anything. Um, very cool. So, yeah, maybe what was what was salient? We'll go around and just share something that was kind of popped out or you can elaborate on something you've already said. Um, and we'll just kind of gather together some some elements of the logos or whatever they say, whatever kids are saying these days. <laughs> mm. Uh, you know, one of the things that stood out to me was this notion of of the logos as a kind of moment where language becomes almost visible. That there's a, almost there's like a production of an optical effect from within dialogical language that's fascinating. I grew up with Terence McKenna, and he was very interested in speculating about the logos as the discovery of a vision-like form of language from within syntax itself. And of course, Wilbur favors the term vision logic to describe the realm of dynamic trans-oppositional insight structures operating across knowledge disciplines. So I'm very intrigued by what that process is. It would be beautiful to see if optical regions of the brain are in fact activated in the moment in which the logos announces itself in the process of conversational understanding within or without. But lately, it's been on my mind because I've been stressing that the structure is sort of affective logic lately, right? That the um, when the logos announces itself as a vision-like structure, that's a secondary registration of a process that's already gone on between uh, syntactical intelligence and something like subtle affect, that it works out a, a felt form, which is secondarily and not always turned into something like a vision logic structure tool, which can then be implemented in thought. And the same way that Antisthenes and even Socrates were worried that writing might over reify and fix the process of the logos. I think we should be a little bit interested in whether or not the production of the vision logic architecture itself is already overly fixating what the logos has produced at an affective syntactical level. Yeah, I think the episode touches on a lot of that stuff. That's that's all. And even the last two really um in concert with that. That's cool. Bruce, uh, same 
Same question. I could comment on things that stood out to me, but I don't want to leave what Lehman said just hanging there because it really is interesting. It's, well, great. Let's 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 uh, double click on that, as Peter Lindbergh says sometimes. Yeah, I can do. I can try to do both. Um, one is, you know, a lot of this is I, I'm 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 going through my Greek education more now than <laughs> um, ever before in terms of not really having paid that much attention to the these roots of of Western thought. Uh, so I've been familiar with logos from its appropriation by other traditions. I've mentioned the time-space knowledge vision, and it uses the logos or the diamond approach, and they use the logos in their own ways. Uh, but what I was just thinking about relative to what uh, Lehman was saying, and, and I really don't know um, how these two things relate, but I'm interested whether something like the modern um, uh, cognitive linguistic concept of uh, image schema uh, plays, and basically the the, the kind of uh, uh, embodied, but also you could say you know imaginal uh, structure that that then it gets exapted, uh, you know, to other layers of our cognitive process. Uh, whether image schema, uh, whether maybe the experience of logos relates in any way to the apprehension of fundamental image schema. Um, in the ordering of thought and the architecture of thought. So not sure about that, or if maybe there's something more transcendent about it, but that was just something that arose in my mind. Um, relative to my own responses to this, one, in a way, it felt like a transitional episode, like it was moving from what came before and setting up a kind of middle ground to anticipate what he really wanted to get to next. So it it didn't feel like there was, for me, a lot there that was central to the architecture of what John is building, but important mediating um, figures for that. Uh, but I, I was struck by a, a number of things, one of which, uh, the two that really stood out to me, uh, and I can talk about them at different points, one is the, uh, the, the focus on, you know, the roots of, of cynicism, and especially how Sloterdijk has taken that up in kinicism. Uh, he, he wants to reclaim the K uh, the, from the original Greek pronunciation to differentiate it from modern distorted forms of cynicism. And a lot of what John covered is covered very beautifully in Sloterdijk's uh, critique of cynical reason. So that's something maybe we could talk about a little bit. Then the other piece about Antisthenes and his focus on clean communication and, and certain um, beautiful, harmonious dialogue and and uh, seeking wisdom through those means, I was really reminded of a big influence on me of Raimon Panikar and his whole work around diatopical hermeneutics and the imperative method. And uh, there's a whole lot there that I think is maybe resonant with what um, Antisthenes is doing. So yeah, go ahead, There's Layman. A please. A bunch add of other this. things that stood out to me in this in this episode, but I I'd really like to go down the ascesis uh, pathway. Uh, I'm very uh, interested in the way Slaughterdyke reconsolidates something that Nietzsche leaves out of his analysis. Right, Nietzsche's essay on the meaning of the ascetic ideal subdivides it into different meanings for different types of people in different contexts, and also does his famous elaboration of why it's pathological in certain contexts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But he's focused very much on the relation to the ascetic ideal, and not so much on ascesis as fundamentally exercise of some kind which he's very much in favor of and he doesn't bring that back together in that essay in quite the way that Slaughterdyke does in, in his work yeah I think that's a fundamental failure of that time in history of Europe to not appreciate practices and the kind of capacity to transcend propositions through practices the capacity to know real things by attuning to nature, maybe by using words to go beyond or through um, or to pull back and look at. Um, and the Stoics, um, I think as a group, are so good at kind of contemplative practices that might be totally verbal. I mean, that's just all we have from them is the, the fragments that are written. But then if you 
go out in nature. Maybe you do some moving practices or some mindfulness while you're walking or while you're standing and then start to contemplate the way that they're describing reality. You can have like, so like John says, this Socratic fundamental shift in your perception. And all of a sudden there's so much ambiguity, uh, plurality of meaning, um, and and you're just relating to yourself in the world in this I would say more beautiful, true, interesting way. Um, and then that the that, that can be cultivated um, makes it even more awesome because then it's not just this trivial kind of mode you're tapping into. It's actually like a way of life where if you devote time and I think devotes the right word and effort to these kind of things, then you're rewarded for that effort in some sense. And that's a very uh, positive framing of it. I think the thing that interested Nietzsche is that the, the framing is related to the implied structure of value that the exercises are being used for, and that over time they can have a different accumulative significance depending on the implied value structure. So where the ascetic ideal is opposed to life, then a life of practice can become an anti-life and slowly degrade even the mechanisms that you use to produce meaning and value over time. So that's the danger of a lot of classical ascetic practice. However, that doesn't undermine the principle of exercise and practice itself, but it does tell us that some unknown percentage of the significance and results is determined by what your relationship is to the guiding value out of which you engage that practice. I think we've talked about this with John before, but yeah, I appreciate Slaughter like picking up on Nietzsche's emphasis on practice in that way, but, but, taking it in a different direction and really looking at humanity. One way that he redefines humanity as, as the practicing species, as the self-reinventing species that, you know, through our, our continual pursuit of different forms of practice, um, we're actually ongoingly transforming ourselves beyond uh, what maybe we might, you know, how we might be determined by any given ecological niche that we were able to push up against those boundaries and actually transcend them in very interesting ways. And so he was a precursor, I think, in one way to looking at a uh, ecologies of practice or a religion that's not a religion. And he wanted to sort of reframe religion, even though it's not only that, as in part a, uh, a vehicle of disciplined practice um, that has transformative aims and goals, whether it is verbal practice and through intensive, you know, contemplative reading, um, or whether it's through different ascetic exercises. Uh, but to situate religious practice alongside all other kinds of forms of practice, including art and sport and mathematics and different kinds of training, all of which he would argue respond are, are cases in which humans respond to a sort of vertical tension within themselves um, to test out the boundaries of what's possible um, and to find more optimized ways of being and performing in, in multiple different contexts so that you can ultimately get what he calls a general disciplinics, um, something that he would uh, kind of a new vision for the university which is not, again, only focused on knowledge acquisition, but in, in some way folds in the gymnasium in, in, in different ways and enfolds in contemplative practice in different ways so that it's overall uh, a very broad, holistic program of, uh, of human training and self-development. But his, his prior work on, um, you know, cynicism and kinicism and, and some of the other Nietzschean roots, I think will help his overall project avoid some of the things that uh, Nietzsche was uh, concerned about, the, the self-undermining, if there's not a if there's not an, a critical awareness of the values which inform any, you know, practice routine. 
Yeah, the notion of of ascesis as something that affords us a transformative possibility in excess of our adaptive niche, I think is a really powerful one. And uh, to me, what underlies that is the sense that there is usually an unperceived embedded boundary in your lived circumstance. And you can notice that by the intentional application of an additional boundary, which then highlights the difference, brings into relief the implied boundary, and offers you the chance to build up a strength. Whether you succeed or fail in the discipline, you build up a strength which might afford you the capacity to see beyond the previously hidden boundary that you're embedded in. Yeah, it's interesting, um, this conscious uh, niche construction practices to uh, transcend limitations or um, flourish and um, the idea of grace, right? Because grace is almost the opposite of that. And the grace is really interesting in this conversation of metanoia because there's a lot like Shin Buddhism, I think, is a super grace focused way to do what you're saying but by humility and group humility and um still uses ritual still has effort it's not like it's a completely like um childlike romanticism where it's like oh i'll just envision on my wish board and then the goddess will shine through into my life and then it'll be this completion um but i, I don't know i just wanted to throw in the the kind of contrasting uh, graceful uh, tension between this. I like that. And, you know, it, it comes up to me, my own internal reflection, sometimes maybe my own internalized voices from my Christian past, um, where when I'm looking at religion and spirituality in terms of practices, um, I can I can hear my internalized voices saying, well, what about grace? Um, but also, you know, just my familiarity with Shin Buddhism and Zen Buddhism, and there's a dialogue and, and, and a, a dialectical tension held between self-power and other power, yeah, yeah. Approaches, right? And so I think that that's essential to keep in mind in, is that, you know, there is, uh, I, I think, you know, echoes of Antisthenes in in what Slaughter Dyke and others are talking about, this emphasis on ongoing self-overcoming. Um, and you might be able to tell me, uh, whether I'm on point with this or not, my my understanding of Antisthenes is more limited. But my sense of Antisthenes is he looks at metanoia almost as he looks like at micro metanoias, kind of like ongoing moments of of self overcoming um, through you know critical engagement, but you know also uh, where he's using, for instance, dialogue to always test his own beliefs and to test his own assumptions. And also to to harmonize with with others and arrive at a, a confluent understanding, but those are like micro metanoia moments. Whereas Slaughterdyke, in his discussion of uh, uh, what he would consider like maybe the potentials for a modern kinesism, he focuses on metanoia more as a really deep fundamental change in in orientation and architecture of thought and self conception that that's a much bigger thing that's that to me is closer to like the the christian um focus on metanoia or the eastern focus about turning about in the seat of consciousness where it's really a more deep fundamental uh profound self other reorientation there's a very interesting thing here about the relation of micro to macro metanoia but i would also like to problematize the difference between grace and discipline uh, for two reasons. One is there's a perfectly plausible scenario in which grace is a phenomenological experience produced by conscious or unconscious adherence to an ascesis of some kind, which then becomes available to you, whether you realize it or not, out of a course of practices, that the peak experience and the glory of the world are not something that are apparent to you at all times. They're apparent to you as a result of an accumulated practice of some kind. And then the other side is that grace itself is always proposed as a practice, even if it's not languaged in those terms, right? If you were going to live a life of grace as opposed to a life of discipline, 
you're then distinguishing those things, right? I'm not going to do those disciplines, which is itself a discipline. I'm going to instead commit myself to grace, which is in a, a particular form of ascesis, right? And there's a logic, there's even a, a yogic lifestyle of becoming better at uh, participatory surrender to the already given qualities of grace and things like that, right? It can be endlessly elaborated, but there's a sense in which it's not fundamentally distinct from discipline. It's a specialized subset of discipline. I've yeah. thought about... Oh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, you go ahead first if you'd like. No, go ahead, Bruce. I find this fascinating. Uh, yeah, that's definitely something I've thought about as well. And uh, when I think about that, that's basically my own orientation is that we're creating a field um, out of which, uh, it, it, as as Wilbur would put it, meditation or you know, realization is an accident and meditation makes us accident prone, which you can say, you know, that certain kinds of insights are a grace and practices make us grace prone. Um, there's a way that you can hold that that I, I think is 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 beautiful and it, it's consonant with my own kind of post metaphysical focus on spirituality, and yet part of the the voice that I always continually hear is that there seems to be a a danger in that of kind of like over self emphasis um, that there's not really allowing for uh, the the self and its structure and its dialectical movement to be deeply ruptured by other. Um, it, it's in, in a subtle attempt to attain or, or to maintain kind of mastery over the process. Um, even if you're saying it's unconscious part of me, it's still kind of, it's still a, an encompass, encompassing move. Um, and I think that's something valid and valuable, but there's a whole sensibility that would come out of Shin Buddhism and other senses, other spiritual approaches that would say, no, you're too much focusing on the kernel of the self and what you can do and not allowing enough for deep radical eruption of other that is transfiguring. The, the way I hold that is that there's a complementary danger, which is the exaggerated focus on the other, which leads people into uh, self-sacrificial degenerative processes of spiritual life. And that the way to avoid both those traps is to be uh, related to the other as an act of agency. It is the self that changes the self's relationship to the other and makes an, the self chooses an other focused approach. It's an ascesis of the self. And when it's not an ascesis of the self, then it risks not being able to distinguish that practice apart from degenerative self surrender. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's neuroscience research that that I read, but I can't, I'm not like an expert in or anything, but there seems to be kind of meditative practices that bring you really like all of your busy mind down into your one self. And then there's like a transcendent movement there. And then there's another kind that really lets go of the self in this like massive othering and they're different. Like you can map some practices very well onto one and some onto the other and they can flip, right? It's not like there's two brains. They're like, Oh, I'll just use half my brain this time. So they're always interactive. And um, I think both dangers are, are really valid. And in Aikido, they have like, we're, we're talking about like Jariki, Tariki and, and the merger of them is I think the, an ideal, but the um, Hajime Tanabe, who John cites more in his first series, maybe he'll set in later talks about metanoia and he's coming from the tradition of, of all this active intuition and kind of Zen as supreme self. And, and they, he goes, oh, wait, but I was in the middle of the Japanese empire when it killed itself and the world and horrible, horrible things. So he was trying to say, like, there is a limit to reason individually and collectively that if we focus too much on self-power, we will fail. And there has to be a grace because the the self critique of reason often fails to fully critique itself to the point to where it opens to grace, and it's it's an easy trap to get into when you're like, oh, the gods within me, awe is in with me, and I can will uh, the good. So I think it's really like cool that we're bringing up both of those elements, and I don't know. I think you it's it's stereoscopically interesting to try and develop both and get a taste for both and. Um, I find it profound just to let go that 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 opening up to the world often 
is just what I need or something like that. When I'm like, oh, I've got all these ideas. Oh, I've got, you know, metamodernism and these 10 scholars and John Verveke. And why am I so trapped in my ideas despite this fecundity of wisdom? And I go, ah, Zange. And just like try to admit the failure of, of the human rationality, both within and without. And then all of a sudden I go, oh, there's a bird. Oh, there's a little river. Oh, and, and it's just like there's something about taking that that leap of faith, the action faith witness that Tanabi talks about is is opposed to the kind of rationality and intuition that some of the other Kyoto school thinkers were saying. It's like, oh, if I just leave my reason through a kind of uh, movement and then open to the grace, it's it leads to salvation in a philosophical religious sense. That brings up two things for me. Uh, one is a languaging issue, which is if I just let go of that stuff, right? That's a good, it's in the language of training. Try to just let go of that. But in the language of explaining, it's a very complex agency that's involved in making that kind of inner shift. Uh, the other part that struck me is the, um, a lot of this has to do with the emotional capacity to allow in uh, emotions whose quality are negative or uncertain, right? There's a, that humility is something that the heart might armor itself against and reinforce a certain kind of exaggerated egoic agency. And when we say, if I just open to grace, now grace sounds very good, but often our ability to access grace is dependent upon our ability to allow in uh, ranges of affect that strike us as negative. This actually came up for me a lot in this series because I can, at the edges of my thinking, I can imagine people hearing a lot of this discussion as sort of uh, one victory after another, you know? just having these logos insights we're having the great conversations the insights are shining forth and announcing themselves we're going to be like socrates and it's going to be win 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 positive 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 grace and yet the uh, the acknowledgement of epistemic humility in socrates's confession of ignorance uh, it often doesn't go far enough right it doesn't really get across that in order to access certain forms of grace and certain forms of logos you have to feel dumb you have to feel like a failure right that the the professor has to be able to hear the mechanic lecture him about the car and it has to be a decent dialogue but there's going to be something an area where you don't have any expertise and you have to emotionally be available to feel like the fool in that circumstance, to feel like the failure to let in the new revelatory insight that comes out of that exchange process. And I think that's similar to the shift toward um, embracing the natural world and embracing grace that uh, upstream of that is this emotional capacity to be permeable to potentially negative affect. Yeah, I think the shadow um, loves to push us away from that kind of truth and go like, no, you're good. Just stop here. Don't go look over there. Don't be uncomfortable. Um, don't be bored and really sit with feelings. And yeah, it's a very important point that you, you uh, I've done some practices with John and he, he languages as like, uh, don't look for insight porn. And uh, this, this utopian thing that he brings up a lot i think is is in line with what you're saying that it's uh it is kind of like catastrophic sometimes when you realize how wrong you are in a way that the ego can't even really confront um is that what you were saying even uh maybe i'm like way up in left field no that's definitely a part of what i was saying <laughs> and that relates in part to something that i wanted to share is I, I think a supplement to you know this this episode which is the work from panikar on communication and how i feel that that uh relates to this question of metanoia and relates to the harmonious um, communication as a path of wisdom that uh antisthenes you know began to lay out um one of the things that panikar argues as an essential spiritual practice for our time uh, and I don't think this is a merely postmodern diversity 
kind of argument, but I think it goes deeper. Um, he he argues that intercultural and interreligious encounter is one of the core essential spiritual um, fields of practice for our time, um, in part because of the potential for radical rupture of, of your own assuredness about the state and nature of being um, and the, the move that you have to make internally to prepare yourself to be informed by and genuinely met um, by positions of, uh, uh, you know, from, from radically different um, contexts and, and sets of presuppositions. And he's not arguing that there is no um, similarity across these different you know, domains and that, in fact, some deep ones can be found, but they can't be found by the simple comparative dialogue where you're looking at what, oh, this is your this is my that, and you just lay them out conceptually. That can't really happen. So he talks about the imperative method is necessary and that's a whole body holistic um, encounter with the other that involves multi dimensions of our of our being not only the cognitive or the dialogical but the effective and in and, and, and presence and the the full allowing yourself to be in a genuine raw encounter with another as other in a way that allows you to let go of enough of your knowingness and sureness and what what layman was saying like in, in confronting the the mechanic to being able to just let go of all of the anchors that you hold on to for your position um and to receive that genuine influx of knowledge and perspective and and you know procedural insight and all of that and and to per- and to participate with other at a deep level leads to what he calls topological transformation. And that's where you begin to um, both uh, change in a way that you can begin to perceive the landmarks within the other space, but your own internal architecture begins to shift as well. And that is, you know, for him, a key moment of metanoia uh, where that that kind of encountering can happen. And, uh, you know, so it's in that process that you arrive at what he would say is dialogical dialogue beyond dialectical dialogue. You know, so there's a, a parallel that John is talking about dialectic into dialogos. And for him, Panikar, dialectical dialogue is still, um, you're still kind of like mediating positions. And, but when you move into dialogical dialogue, there's that, that's that moment of metanoia um, and kind of deep, existential participatory contact with the other that can be fundamentally um reorienting yeah that um you know the the metanoia through the disruptive encounter with the others of the plurality uh i'd like to connect that to uh john's remarks on larping in this episode which are really interesting because yes there's a disruptive potential in the encounter itself but there's also a disruptive potential in the becoming other, right? So that a lot of people, um, I mean, it's very easy to um, believe that you support diversity when you haven't actually lived in any other cultures or communities whatsoever. You haven't played the role of the other. Uh, and there's something about role playing that allows you to become immersed to the point where you lose the context, the original constellation of your identity. And now that rupture is available to you in an embodied, enacted way. And I think that's really essential. Like when John's talking about the LARPing, I thought a lot about you know, the notion of these epistemic transformations of evolutionary history in integral and other developmental models, where there's sort of a, a kind of slanderous view of actors in a lot of traditional culture because the idea of taking different roles is disruptive to a social order that's based on playing out one inherited role over the course of a lifetime. Uh, Modernity becomes much more affirmative of the individual who could take several roles. And then post-modernity says, well, you are yourself a theater troupe that can take different roles. 
and at the as these capacities to play roles increase if people actually uh, undergo the circumstances of doing some role playing like the larpers are doing then by undoing the coordinates of your sense of self you can pass into the other some version of the other and pass back and then you are re-arrived in your original context with a, a viscerally deeper understanding that it is a set of roles which can then be critiqued and teased apart and that seems to be what the cynics are doing right they're coming back into um, the conventional role playing that constitutes their own society and they're critiquing it as being sometimes valid organic moral wisdom oriented and sometimes degenerate into these purity code possibilities and they can only see that because they've gone deep enough into some other role playing yeah i think it's really profound um how even just participating in little bits in other cultures uh it, it's it's amazing i mean you can definitely like bullshit yourself but it's amazing that you can watch drama and music from japan and egypt and persia and africa and get all of this kind of perspectival richness and see like wow that's so different than me like i would never never in america could i find people um there's this japanese drumming where they're wearing like a loincloth and they're just pounding for like two hours and there's like butt cheeks everywhere and sweat and and you know it's like that's so not what happens in any kind of um american play movie like ritual environment and you go oh wow there's a i i find it like tantalizing and refreshing i go like oh this is so cool there's alternatives to this stale uh imperialistic point of view that's that's in america and uh it's it's so creative and, and even comparing yeah like like we were talking about kind of at the beginning a little bit these philosophical schools that were wedded to earlier shamanistic cultures and korean shamanism is different than japanese shamanism is different than native american uh mytho poetic uh ways of life and and how if you really encounter it both with yourself fully present and give it its credence it's it's really kind of beautiful i mean it has i think even maybe this might be a little sacrilegious, uh, but like I think John even gets nervous by some of these. Like we've talked about this before, when it gets a little too weird and uncanny, I go, "Oh, what well, my scientific background? I, I'm not sure what to do with that." Um, and and yeah, I think that's the um, there. There's a danger too, right? Because like you can lose your own balance in these encounters. Um, I studied multiculturalism in academia under some pretty heavy hitting scholars and went to some conferences. And it's really kind of cool that when two cultures interact, they have this kind of two box model where one could dominate, um, what, they could drop out completely and just ignore it, or there'd be these mixtures. And like, to me, the mixture way seemed the most healthiest, unless you really were trying to acclimate to a new culture on purpose. And it's cool that, you know, yeah, I love this idea of metaxu and metanoia by encountering uh, the sacred and I guess probably the profane too of other cultures. Um, yeah, this is excellent. Yeah, I think there's a kind of, uh, I mean, to use Christian language, a kind of perichoretic logic um, where you're, uh, there's both, you know, the self other distinction and there's simultaneously the circumpenetration, the circumincessional participation one in the other. Um, and it's, a, it's an art to be able to do that and not utterly lose yourself. Um, and I, I've looked for a long time at, you know, trans lineage practice as a really good example of that. People like, uh, Abhishek Dananda, Henry Lasso, um, or B. Griffiths or some other people like that who have attempted to actually Panikar himself, I don't remember the exact quote, but he says, you know, I left home a Christian, I became a Hindu, I became a Buddhist, and I came back home a Christian. And but he's all of them. Um, and he so in a way it's a LARPing, um, you know, in terms of a role playing, 
Um, or maybe you could say LARPing is a mini version of that. I think it would probably be better way to say that the LARPing is the mini version of the willingness to allow for some kind of fundamental conversion um, that also remains faithful to your own roots. Um, and there, there are periods of conversion where you want to reject your roots. And there's so many stories of Westerners who embrace the East, you know, only when they're 50 or 60 years old to suddenly discover in the West that there was a lot of stuff that they didn't even know was there that they're now suddenly reappreciating, you know. So there's this prodigal return, right? Um, but I think it's this really uh, beautiful field of of practice um in in some of my classes i talk about the seven stages of deep dialogue and what are some of the processes along the way of that transformation between self and other the first one is just you're struck by the otherness it's like wow that's different i want to be back home where it's familiar but it was cool for the moment while i experienced it and now i'm back in the comfort but then it can begin to work in you and say okay actually what else was there and how can that world work, right? And and what's the logic of that space? And you maybe enter back in um, until gradually you might get to a point where you've changed enough that now you are alien in your own space. And then how do you navigate the attentions that emerge there? And so there's a whole whole dance that can go on through you know multiple phases in navigating those. Um, boundaries and learning to be metaxu. Another thing that came up for me in this episode, uh, this pertains to uh, uh, the kinics versus the cynics, let's say, uh, is I remembered um, the first time I encountered Slavo Zizek, and it was my friend in high school had bought this book, Seinfeld and Philosophy, which I was very dismissive of. But one day out of boredom, I flipped through it and I found a chapter on Jay Peterman, who was one of my favorite characters on the show. And it referenced Zizek heavily, making a kind of pre-trans distinction between what he called irony and cynicism. So we're sort of conflating people who have some distance from the established conventional forms in their society and these other people who are anchored in some other set of conventional forms and use that to dismiss this one. So you might be against both parties because you're actually have an affinity for some dictatorial or alternative system, which isn't more sophisticated. You don't actually have any ironic distance. You're just committed to something else, which is an alternative. Now, that's really intriguing to me because that's one of the things John's saying about the, let's say, the deficient sense of cynicism versus the sufficient sense, that the deficient cynic is not realizing when they dismiss everything as artificial or illusionary, what they're affirming in that act, right? That the actual cynics were uh, able to enter into the transformational sophrosin of the value that's implied by the things that they're critiquing. I always relate this to this Nietzsche quote I love about uh, he who despises himself still honors himself as one who despises, right? That the, um, your immediate access to the positive value is implied by the structure of your devaluation of something. You can't devaluate without being in contact with the value. And that is a profound underlying structure in a lot of spiritual practices, because it means wherever you encounter something that seems insufficient, you are in direct contact with the sufficiency if you can pivot your orientation to it and then become involved in the soft sin of that. Yeah, I think, I mean, the, the cynics were in love with the good. That's, they were, I mean, uh, Socrates created this ripple in the Mediterranean that inspired so many schools. There was like 12 or 14 schools, people usually count among them. Like we've lost all the Socratic material. Like there was libraries full of scrolls all over that region with Socratic thought and discipline. And we've just lost all that. And then we have, like Epicurus wrote a lot, like we have a lot of his work. Um, we have a ton from the Stoics, like we're so lucky. We have all of Marcus Aurelius. We have a lot of Epictetus. Um, but there was, I mean, the skeptics left almost nothing. So so this this richness of like this, this figure 
came into the world as like the first new species of primate and just rippled forward in time. And yeah, it's easy to dismiss the cynics as gross or simplistic or naive or the stoics as unrealistic or the Epicureans as like, you know, deprived atomists. But but underlying all of them is like this this thinker that was into like the soul in a very real way and and was also loyal to the city and loyal to the philosophical process and and the the ripples and it's it's so great that they're all so different and i think it's one of the cool things about the greeks compared to let's say the some strains of buddhism at least that i've encountered in the west is like there's a real individuality to the cultural of philosophy where it's not like even the platonists are all very different and go in different directions and if you just put socrates at the epicenter of all this the the different traditions that came after him were not just cloning oh let's just oh not like thought like zombies right like thoughtlessly clone it's like oh who how does like you were saying bruce how does this speak to me how does this new culture interact with me and then birth something out of me not just as um you know plato's kind of second best thing not to get too all over the place is like the, the copier is a tragic figure because they don't understand what they're copying um so so yeah i think this is super rich what we're saying here and, and the like the the d- dynamics and the statics of the good um and the historical arc that it's it's rippling through. I mean, even uh, again, like like people like John uh, and both of you, right? Like you're rippling through other people's lives. There's there's a. Uh, it's really kind of cool that that humans can do that. We can through relationships share our inner lives and our outer lives and and be something new across time and space. I was really thinking about the the re-emphasis or the reinvigoration that Slaughter like back in I think it was like eighty three he wanted to give to um, the cynical school cynical school and to differentiate it from modern cynicism which basically has given up any hope on there being effective personal or or social change and so then it becomes a kind of uh, dismissive and self serving kind of orientation. And obviously, quite removed from from what was going on with Antisthenes and 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 you know those after him, uh, but I was thinking then that you know there was this, an uh, an you know an emphasis again on on playfulness and breaking um, and and breaking convention, while still having that love of the good and the belief in something valuable still being possible um and that the 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 crazy wisdom stuff is done you know obviously that you know the the convention breaking stuff is done in the interest in the pursuit of the good as opposed to you know the modern cynic and that seemed to anticipate back in the 80s what is now being surfaced in meta modernism as sincere irony you know the 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 desire to both be able to be self-critical and to recognize the limitation of thought and to hold oneself in a certain bracketed way, and yet to allow yourself to be uh, still in love with the good and the fruits of the good. Um, I think there's a little bit of different emphasis between, you know, maybe maybe Slaughter Dyke was still uh, focusing a li- little bit more on on irony um, and and not quite allowing as much of the sincerity through, but I think he was already claiming that space. And of course he wasn't the first Foucault was kind of looking back to the cynics and uh, Hado was looking back to the cynics, but I think Sloterdijk really gave a, a one of the most sustained modern looks at the, that movement and the value of that movement and what it can do um, not only individually, but pro-socially. And I think that's a key thing is, is that, uh, for it to be marshaled pro-socially and, and in a broad, broadly culturally critical way, rather than just you know for individuals to work on. Yeah, the the pro-social and the 
the deeply self-aware disruption of the conventional, I think is, uh, well, it's a beautiful thing about the way John is presenting the Kinnicks as these sort of goodness oriented public performance artists. Uh, I really enjoyed that. Um, the thing that stood out to me in that, uh, when he's trying to make the distinction, John, between essentially the kind of uh, wise morality that is authentically informing a polis and the kind of degenerative purity code morality. And John very much wanted to, and this probably goes to some of his own <laughs> experiences in life, um, distinguish that the purity codes aren't interested in what your reasons are or intentions are for the activity. It's merely the form of the activity itself that's problematic. That's an interesting distinction to make. And I went back to Nietzsche, as I often did in this episode, because Nietzsche has a riff on the three ages of morality, the pre-moral, the moral, and the post-moral. And his distinction between the pre-moral and the moral is that in the pre-moral age, there's no attribution of intentionality. You're guilty by association, right? If the Kurds die next to her house, she's a witch, you kill her, right? doesn't matter what she thought she was up to. The moral age specifically is one in which we take the interiority of the individual trained up by civilization into account in making our moral judgments. So I was curious to think about this distinction between, say, the moral and the purity code as being either essential to anatomically modern humans at all periods of their history where we either degenerate or function or in the developmental sense is the degenerate version a return to an authentic but more simplistic more primitive version of the moral code right is it a, is it a regress to something valid on its own level and degenerate relative to the level we're working on or is it fundamentally pathological, no matter where in the historical process you are? I was curious what your take on that would be, Bruce. I think both are involved, but I can definitely think of, of cases where um, when you look at the surface, it looks like it's degenerate. But when you actually really speak to the people about what they're doing and why they're doing it, you know, like looking at the punks, right? I mean, you look at the punks, they look like they're degenerate. But if you really talk in depth to what the punks were trying to do there was a you know they were turning to a kind of a simpler and cruder way of being but it was out of a deeper kind of moral conviction um, for many of them it wasn't just you know flaunting authority or, or indulgence in in you know red egotistical impulses or things like that there was often a desire to connect with something that's authentic and raw and real um and one of the things that i was also thinking about here was uh, Slaughter Dyke, in, in relative to the uh, purity codes, um, he notes that we suffer in the West, that the purity codes have kind of morphed in our time into what he calls hygienic nihilism, and that there is a pursuit of cleanliness and order and fitness um, and the and the the, the bod bodied self care um, that has become an end of it in, in itself that's divorced really from any field of meaning or, or, you know, broader pro-social um, set of practices or concerns. So for him, I guess it, it, it connects maybe to what Chogyam Trungpa later would call, you know, spiritual materialism or maybe about the same time, but there's something else too. There's this, this, even in the, the modern, you know, commercial culture, uh, uh, in the West, this focus on hygiene and order and fitness and and self improvement routines often are deeply nihilistic and and can be seen as a kind of uh, extension of the purity code. Yeah, I think that's that's through Symmachus's relativism is is the that kind of nihilism and and. Um, yeah, it's it's that's again it's a great con contrast to the ancient cynics, uh, and and just the philosophical idea of of justice and self transcendence, like uh, that you're really not living a life of justice when you're grooming a lot and spending your you know devoting yourself to your appearance, your image, and the you know I, I a friend of mine was saying earlier today like. Uh, lust is one of the greatest ways to escape dealing with reality, right? So if you're just in this embodied, lustful, 
image, um, it's really easy to not uh, contemplate deeper and and try to uh, try to go for more justice. Is I think a really crucial part of of the good because it has this sense of equanimity um, between and within. So it, it's both like, am I honoring myself? Am I honoring the world that, that ultimately, like I love when people talk about like their ancestors and traditions, right? Because every person uh, we've talked about this every episode, like we're inspired by these authors and these groups and these, you know, like, thousands of years across you know millions of lives just in the three of us and how we view the world let alone like if we encounter 10 other people today and how much uh justice is required and, and agopic trans self-transcendence when it yeah like the the um i really love gun Han talks about like the smooth and john brings him up and and this idea of we're just always looking at our reflection we don't want to look real deep. We don't want to be confronted by like a thousand armed God that's going to tell us there's powers greater than us. Um, and and how important that that moment is, those moments are probably is a better way to say it, um, to to live on reality. I, I love when just to keep tying it back to John, like the, the meta desire for goodness, but also the real. And the real can be very ugly and scary and and boring and, and all those things that maybe you don't associate with with the good, the true, the beautiful. Um, There's something confessional coming up for me right now, and I don't know to share it widely in public, you know, because I uh, but I've talked to John about it in our our, uh, you know, rethinking religion series uh, where and, and, and to layman, you know, all my life. I've been kind of on a purity path, not really. I haven't held it in a rigid way in, ever, but I've always been largely contemplative and ascetic in my my life and my practice. No smoking, no drinking, no drugs, vegetarian for most of my life. And so I've lived largely purely in that way without without rigidity around it. But in this last year, getting old enough to say, what the fuck? I've I've started to experiment with psychedelics. So I've had three journeys and I just had one a few days ago. That was my third one. It's maybe going to be my last one. I don't think it's going to be a path for me, but I wanted to do that. But the reason I'm bringing it up is there was a really distinctive moment in that experience that I'm, I'm relating to some of what you were saying in terms of like looking in the mirror and wanting to only see beauty and things like that. In my second session, when I was working with my guide, I saw him very clearly in archetypal form, and it was very striking. Both it was powerful and radiant, and also something un somewhat unreal, you know, and not kind of incomplete, right? But I was curious about that, and so he suggested, "Why don't you do a mirror exercise on our third journey?" And so I did a mirror exercise, and I was actually quite um, disturbed by the kind of archetypal mask that my face presented to me. And it was not a face that was easy for me to digest, um, easy for me even to relate to. I was surprised by the visage that was confronting me. Um, there was a lot of intensity of feeling in it. And I asked my guide, are you seeing my face? <laughs> he said, yeah, you look normal to me. But when I looked in there, it was like I was looking at something really difficult to 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 receive in terms of the energy and the fierceness of the gaze. Um, there was a mixture of of pain and anguish and intensity and and wrathfulness um, that doesn't feel like my surface personality. Uh, but the reason I wanted to mention that was that that practice. I could have easily closed off to that and been been uh, dismissive of that as a, a an undesirable part of myself or or anything. But for whatever it's worth, I, I was able to hold it and just take it in in its fullness as much as I could, um, in a way that I could be in some way penetrated by 
whatever intensity of feeling was there as uncomfortable as it was. And I can't speak to any fruits of that yet because I don't know where it's going to land other than coming out of the overall session with a, a sense of well-being and okayness with the world. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to, to mention that. I don't know if I get you in trouble for that, talking that's about That's really interesting to me because it, um, it, it connects to a thing that I've been pondering relative to this episode, right? And what I'm hearing, part of what I'm hearing and what you're saying is uh, the encounter with body as other in the same way we were talking about the potentially disruptive and transformative encounter with the other and also the ability to move into the position of the other in a way that disrupts conventional role playing because one of the things that stood out to me thinking about Antisthenes and the cynics was that the uh, that the dog philosophers are also announcing the organism as the thing that does the philosophy uh, there's a great, uh, I don't know if you know, Durkheim, uh, Carl Fried Graft, not a meal, a German philosopher who wrote the original Western text on the Hara. Uh, he had a great phrase about distinguishing between the body you are and the body you have, right? So we tend to have this, uh, you know, Cartesian role playing where I have the body, but there's another sense in which I am the body. The body is that which speaks I to itself, and the body is that which can participate in the logos. And by affirming themselves as the dog, the mammal, the animal, the organism, the kinics are uh, proposing biology itself as a locus of a syntactical and transformative process in a way that's really beautiful and much closer to a lot of our contemporary understandings about the complexity of the organism and the, uh, the virtual nature of a lot of our self-thinking about the eye apart from the body. Yeah, the body is is profound and way richer than I think any conceptions that are happening in like college undergrad philosophy classes. And um, yeah, even just, yeah, I think so much that you both just said there that it's hard to kind of pull, pull a through line. Let's see, what is the through line to all this? Um, yeah, the, the, I mean, the body is, is both immediacy and it holds time. It's really weird. Like, like all of our memories are held in our body. Um, I was in a walk just, just earlier before this, and I saw these just striking trees and I go like, Oh, I wish I could be you because I know you're having a different experience than I am right now. And then you do that. And then kind of every tree you see after that is also, it's, it's a being and it's, it's an embodied being that has a, a perceptual and thus aesthetic and thus conceptual or whatever. I don't think it has much of a conceptual, maybe reality. I don't know, but, but the, the beingness of, of other beings um, and even within us, like there's so much mystery um, to our, our bodies. It's fun to watch little kids fumble around with their bodies or really elegant dancers move. Um, Japanese Budo where like you roll around and you enact, Rafe Kelly actually has some cool practices like this as well, where you start to get into the, the beingness of a moving, relating being rather than as an intellect trapped in this horrible mortal shell. Even, um, you know, I've got the, the Enneads right here. Even poor Plotinus had a sense of shame of his body that probably robbed him of some beauty like for as amazing of a philosopher and of a of a part of our cultural legacy as he is um that that disconnect there's there's so much rhythm and surprise uh yeah i love this this body as other that's a really um you could contemplate that deeply and and get a lot of value out of it sounds like even plutinus snakes needs to take a course called unfolding the senses <laughs> well, the Gnostics alienated the body so horribly back then. And and a lot of Christianity, I, I, I don't really have much of an opinion on this, but I have a lot of friends that feel it's also alienating the body and they get really upset that they want to love this really popular thing that everyone thinks is beautiful. But then they're so confused by how they feel about the body as this source of beauty and pleasure and presence that when they they try to engage with those myths and those uh you know that that tradition that they find it really challenging whereas um there's some really cool movement psychotechnologies that especially because of the internet 
um, you can learn about. And, you know, Feldman Chris is like a little bit of this, but there's even, I think, much, much richer uh, practices. I don't know. Sometimes I'll, I'll like be like, I wonder what it's like to be a cow. And oh, man, my feet would be dirty. That would be different. And I'd have weird teeth and two stomachs. And I'd be so attracted to grass that it would mesmerize me. And you start to kind of play in that field literally and metaphorically if you're the cow um and and all of a sudden you go oh wow reality is so much richer than it was when i was just you know in my little tiny universe i have a couple random things to throw together in relationship to all of that so i'm really gonna challenge you with your through lines next time here okay <laughs> um one uh is yeah in the in the second journey that I had, I had a, a pretty rough time with the second half of it. And part of it was encountering the body as other and encountering it exactly in the form that, you know, some of the Christian mystics or the Buddhists would contemplate it as the site of decay and progression towards death and, and you know, um, kind of the, the sub human in terms of like what we're used to the human being the enculturated self and it's more the much more primitive levels of, of of the body those came forward very strongly in the second journey the third one was this you know unassimilable face and one thing that i was relating that to because it came with such a feeling of uncanniness um and almost surreal surreality and in our you know, especially if you follow like in transpersonal psychology and in some of those fields of post-existential philosophy, uh, our return to the body and our reintegration with our body, the the initial steps in that direction first feel like a derealization of the world. Um, when we our, our projects and our aims stop seeming so compelling. And, and we become disillusioned with the things that society has given us that we've been chasing. Um, a lot of the world becomes flat. Um, it becomes derealized and we move into a, a place of uh, kind of like withdrawing energy back into ourselves and kind of a depressive introspection. Um, but as that progresses and we actually begin to move more deeply back into the, the, the bed of the body, um, and some of our our repressed material can begin to surface again. There's a period, and I've I've experienced this before multiple times, where it's instead of the world being derealized, it's the world is supercharged with strangeness, and it becomes surreal. And looking at nature, looking at trees, looking at yourself, it's it's suddenly imbued and dripping with this bizarre otherness um and of course that's not where you always have to that's not the end of the journey but there's such an encounter there um, and it depends on what you what then what you do with that what how you move through that but i think that is part of that reclamatory if i can make a word journey of reclamation um is through that that field of surreality and that that surcharged um up experience of otherness so that's one piece then the other very quickly i'll just say castaneda tradition um there's a lot of with the toltec magic tradition sorcery tradition there's a lot there one of which a key practice there is larping um where you deliberately become a different being and then you go and try to interface in circles that know you and not have them recognize you. And so you've got to practice basically dissolving your own boundaries to a degree that you can enter into another role and then show up in familiar spaces um, and not be recognized. And so that's part of an overall um, spiritual practice on the way to becoming a master of energy or a sorcerer, an agua. Um, if you don't have the mastery over your own energy, you're going to leak. People are going to recognize you. So that that's just part of a disciplined practice. But they also had this practice called tensegrity. They borrowed that, of course. 
Um, there's also the the Toltec words for it, um, involving these certain body movements and what they call magical passes, breathing and postures and energy circulation. But the reason I'm mentioning that is that even though it's not set out as an aim of the practice, there are these weird lines or, or just comments that are thrown in in terms of explicating what the practice involves. And some of them are that if you are doing this practice right, you are going to begin to experience the world as subjectively organized by a dragonfly or as subjectively organized by some other entity. And so there's the suggestion that doing the postures and breathing and, and, and the movements in a controlled way will actually open you up to another, uh, you could say, you know, embodied inaction of a world space that will be consonant with or resonant with some, yeah, world space, some, uh, you know, semiotic, biosemiotic bubble of another kind of being. Yeah, if we take the uh, we take the cynics as standing in part for the position of the body in the history of philosophy uh, that's been to some degree regenerated uh, in the last few hundred years, uh, we have kind of a tool to distinguish between the ascesis that becomes pure oriented, degenerate, uh, excessively hygienic, and the kind of ascesis that can build forward from the body. From the kind of you know Nietzsche's Zarathustra's return to the body and Timothy Leary's neurosomatic turn on and things like that, but there are some valid cautions around the spiritual paths that place somatic turn on at their core. How do you handle a path that moves forward from neurosomatic turn on in a way that's responsible and not just derealizing and dropping out of conventional social structures? And I think you touched on two of the essential components of that Bruce. One is uh, leaning into the world as a psychophysical realm, that the derealization becomes uh, uh, an even pleasing uncanniness, becomes the shamanic potential of the sensory environment. And the other one is to start to work with that as a transformational plurality for the body to start to try to also experience the role of the other bodies and spread itself out as a form of expansive intelligence rather than as a point of contraction from what's been derealized. That's beautifully encapsulated. I love how you put that. Well, it's, it's, it's something like, right. Like the more our culture has places for these things, the more transformational capacity we have like like the the recession uh or even better like the disappearance of ritual Gran Han has a book called called that the, as as we lose these as like normal all over the place in our culture and the buildings that that symbolically house our values and the types of roles that we share with our young people or inhabit ourselves become like so anemic from this perspective of of you know jeep form and and uh shamanism and and dragonfly role play um that that capacity i guess i really like what we were saying earlier about like intent like if you just judge that and go like ah oh, that's gross wash it away these these sick pagans these devil worshipers and and similar things or if you go like wait what were they trying to do why why would they do that and how could that be beneficial um, and then it's like really profound because then you can start to reharmonize with your environment and go, oh, I can kind of imagine what it's like to be a jellyfish or I can imagine what it's like to be a hummingbird. And um, and how could I honor those presences rather than turn them into objects to trade on the market or parts of like the human territory to be, uh, you know, killed at a whim and and I think this that that all all ancient cultures, you know, how how you mark even within a person's life, like, oh gosh, I'm starting to menstruate. Like I need some way to process this new reality. Um, oh good, there's people that know that reality that can come into my life and help me understand that. Or I have to start um being unselfishly giving to the group because that's my place in society. And how do I do that? Or 
you know, a lot of ancient culture, I'm sure both of you know this more than me, they'll like kick a person out for seven years and make them live in the wild. And then they'll come back and maybe they'll be of service to the culture for three years or seven years. And then after that, they're like these awesome members of society and they have good, healthy internal lives too. And when we don't have those structures, we're, we're just adrift in like postmodern pluralism and, and nihilism to where people like, it's, it's sad that people don't even grasp what good is anymore they don't even realize what pain is and can't even see their own suffering um because there's such a small definition of what it means to be a person that most people are kind of holding in their their mind's eye as they navigate this culture one thing that's in my mind in terms of you know, the role that Diogenes played uh, and what you were just saying about certain cultures being able to do that. I was recalling an experience in India and, you know, controversial sect is the Agori Babas, um, where, you know, they cover themselves in human ash and often go naked or barely dressed. And they live around charnel grounds and uh, they, they, interact with or you know refuse and different things like that so they basically are deliberately confronting the purity codes of the culture as a life path um and you can say that there is definitely the potential and, and the, the manifestation of degeneracy in the agori baba circles but there's also i think a genuine transformative path and a kind of wisdom there and i recall being in karnataka i think in the city of um Vijayanagar or or Hampi. Um and just this the strikingness of the alienness of of what was happening. You know, so very colorful and but it was like this intense heat and suddenly this insect like insistent sharp buzzing and then this little tight drum it didn't sound musical. It sounded intense and it actually felt like it was amplifying the heat and the intensity of the whole environment. And there's a crowd that was moving and right in the front of the crowd was this, you know, Agori Baba who was, you know, not dressed, holding a human thigh bone and chewing on it and clobbering people with it and growling and sounding like an animal. Um, and just moving through the streets and the whole city was organizing itself around this display as something sacred. Even though in the ordinary life, if you've met somebody in their home, they would be horrified by seeing a dead human body or, but they were, they were enfolding it as part of sacred process. Um, and, and uh, yeah, anyways, I, I just feel like we have little ruptures in our society, but we have no way that I feel like, except maybe in, in some films or something, but to me, not with the same immediacy, that this feels like it's folded in to the wisdom of the culture. The, um, you know, what they half jokingly call the California school of metamodernism, which works on magical invocative performances to undermine spaces that came up for me. And I think we do have a lot of that kind of stuff in the avant-garde and fringe art communities. But the danger in, in all these cases is the over-familiarization and over-concretization of a form, right? And maybe someone who's violating a custom is crazy the first few times you see them, but pretty soon you just step past them on your way to the subway or whatever, right? So it has, the enactment has the same risk that Antisthenes is pointing to with language when he says, well, I mean, it has one of the two risks. He's looking at two risks and one risk is language is really problematic when it comes to working with the oppositional processing necessary to cause the logos to announce it forth as what is and what was but the other part is that it over fixates when it tries to get a linguistic definition and then it gets stuck there and can't really perform its function it ceases to be uh Genlin's unfolding and becomes just this chunk and the same thing can happen with the language of social performance and ritual 
So a ritual does have a special way in which it can repeat itself under the right artistic conditions, but we also have to be aware that it can get into these same problems and lose its dynamism if it becomes over fixated. Right. Like I would say, let's expand Antisthenes' complaint to all forms of communication in their tendency to get stuck and their tendency to become non-opponent processing forms. Yeah, I like that. And how do we how do we deal with that in a way that doesn't turn into simply escalation for escalation's sake? Um, I feel like that that is happening in some art, that there's just an attempt to get more shocking in a way that doesn't really feel wisdom producing. Well, I think we've touched on a lot of the factors that mitigate that already in this discussion, right? The um, emotional vulnerability to negative affect in yourself and the right kind of dialogue with your peer group and the um, awareness that what you're doing is implicitly rooted in the structure of the good, that you wouldn't be able to do it unless the good was already implied. And to bring that into the foreground, I think we'll handle a lot of that, make it much more pro-social. Yeah, it's really tricky because I, I love the cynics and the stoics for their, it's, it's amazing. Like if you read the history of a lot of the stoics, they give up power, wealth, um excessive sexuality right i was just reading the protagoras uh yesterday and they're always talking about alcibiades the hottest guy around and how it's amazing that socrates isn't just always trying to have sex with him and it's like it's like wow you know that is a it's a weird view in some sense because i mean most most young people are that are looking for mates are like how can i better myself to attract more sex and power and freedom and um and not that that's bad right like in moderation those things are all part of our vital humanity and then in excess they become degenerate and rob us of our flexibility and our capacity to care for others and for ourselves so it's it's i, I liked in john's first series the the kind of mistake of the cynics was to think that like everything was was all the same and the stoics take it a little more sophisticatedly and say, oh, there's the world and our reaction to it or conception of it. And, you know, Marcus Aurelius, when you read him talk about like uh, sex is rubbing two abdomens together or things like that, you go, oh, yeah, like this computer that I'm worshiping as a god is plastic that was sand and glass and metal that was just uh, boring and annoying and in the earth for most of its history. So when I deify it and go like, oh, my gosh. You know, I, I have, I mean, a rocket just launched from Cape Canaveral. We confuse it and project all this meaning onto things and, and to start to tease that apart. I don't know if you've ever seen um, The Hidden Fortress, the Kurosawa movie. No. It's awesome. Like there's this, it's, there's a samurai and he's guarding a princess who is like the next in line, but the opponents, like if they find out, it'll be horrible. And they get caught at the very end. And she... The, the samurai is like embarrassed. He's like, I'm so sorry. Her aide is like, oh, we're so sorry that we we failed our mission. And she's like, no, 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 thank you. I got to live life. I was stuck in this castle and I could, I you showed me what it was like to fail and fall in love and see weird art rituals. Uh, they get to hang out with all of these kind of peasants and, and encounter reality. So it's it's cool that, you know, we're kind of like these princesses trapped in our royal lives. And these philosophers are trying to break through into our reality and show us, oh, you know, you don't have to be just this little role or see the world one way. Um, and it's all so imaginal and so philosophical. It's not just like you're hoping to get into it. Um, as we've said a couple of times, there's a lot of danger. And, and uh, when you start to play with this, the fantastic can become a fantasy and a delusion. But yeah, I just think that the way John is presenting this and he talks about improv and jeet form and uh, Genlin or Genlin's practices of, of having these kind of symbolic dialogical um, interplay between our bodies and our minds and our, our somatic and our uh, conscious and things like that is really um, so profound. And then if we could, again, kind of see more practices that are, healthy or that are maybe that's the wrong word but that are, are philosophically useful and good and start to kind of 
bring this into our society rather than than just opt out. It's it's there's so much potential. I would love to see schools doing like you know cynic role playing or uh, uh, do you know Crates in the in the the lentil pot story? Crates is a famous cynic. And uh, he joined, he was like an aristocrat and uh, he was always embarrassed in public about things. So they'd make him carry around a little soup of lentils. And then his, his leader would always smash it and it would spill on him and he'd get embarrassed and flustered and run off. And it's like, we need to be crates a little bit and, and, you know, have the bravery to carry around the soup pot, knowing that it's going to get smashed and, and then observing that. Um, so I, 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 I layman, I think you do this all the time when, when I ask you about like what you've been up to, you're like, Oh, I'm doing this new cool retreat and it's super weird and creative and people are loving it. They're loving this like imaginative interplay between the environment or other parts of themselves. And I think that's really, um, has a ton of promise and it's not just like woo of like, how can I ignore society? It's like this very transformative, um, potential. You know, what I liked was your description of people being bored and annoyed by the minerals that laying around in the earth. <laughs> I'm just imagining these people. <laughs> Goddamn sands just laying there. Well, turn it into something. Come on. Where is where is Jeff Bezos? We need him. Get, turn this into a, some box that we could ship. <laughs> I think essential to everything you were saying, and I think essential to John's work as well, is is getting the getting the ratio right. You know, when we it's very easy to be misleading when we talk about moderate versus excessive in some area like sexuality or food or thought or whatever it is. And excess isn't fundamentally defined by quantity. It's defined by whether you're gripping correctly or not, whether you're becoming over fixated in something, because anything we can say, well, don't do it to excess. But even that attitude is used to justify alternative forms of excess in terms of fixated over identification that becomes problematic down the line. So it's about getting the balance or the grip just right and not about having too much or none of any particular thing. 100%. Yeah, I think um, it's it's transjective and it takes uh, I've seen many people ask John, uh what is my practice? Should it be like, and, and should it be these four things? And he, he often throws it back and says, well, it depends, right? It depends where you are, how it's helping you function or dysfunction. And so, you know, it's, it's really tricky. And even in, um, what is it? The, uh, kind of raw food movement. There's some really good people that talk about, um, how to eat really healthy and how, how these dietary things, but even, two people can eat the same exact thing and have dramatically different impacts. And I could bloat and you could thrive off of virtually the same diet or even at me at one point versus another, the, the Stoics and the cynics are, are great at talking about, um, you know, if you're healthy, then, then this will work. But if you're diseased, then this won't, you need to work on that first to then have the benefit of your diet or whatever it is. So this, this transjectivity, it's very subtle because it can slip into the subjective or the objective easily. Um, but it's, it's, you know, maybe such a powerful idea that John articulated and continues to influence people with. And even, even in Metaxu and in Metanoia, it's a transjective um, dance, not just like, oh, if I just repeat these koans, uh, I'll be enlightened and then every time i touch something it'll you know be better or whatever love the silence beautiful silence Are there other, we can definitely like land the plane. We've been talking for a while. Is there other parts of the episode? I know like most of what I wrote down, we've brought up. Um, is there anything or about Slaughter Dyke? I thought that was really interesting when he kept coming up or they kept coming up. I feel, I feel good about this journey. I feel, I feel pretty fed by it.
Yeah, I think we covered a lot of stuff. It's probably enough for today. Um, each one of the things we went into is a, a lifetime's inquiry. Mm -hmm. Sweet. I feel more more inner peace and connected to the real. So I think that's that you can't ask for more. I'm going to go Esquisis and Ponus a little bit <laughs> and uh, then maybe, you know, do something perverted in public to provoke uh, Metaxu and others. <laughs>